Um, okay. Where do I start? Um, I think In what... Terms of getting all the science, science what, 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 what you are doing is very familiar to me. Having a seminar like this um, and raising awareness uh, and getting people enthused is your job. And, uh, and it does take one person to really uh, enthuse and organize the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the group or your community and write proposals as you're doing. So I think you should be congratulated on that just to start with. Uh, so it's a good start. Um, what I then did was I then took my bike or my car or my tra train and I went to each of the universities and I went and I met the people in their universities and I showed them that I was going to do this uh, no matter what and I'd like them to be part of it. And uh, people really appreciated that um, I came to their institutes and, and I talked about the project and I invited them in. And I constantly kept that communication going to make them feel that it was their project as much as, as it was Trinity College Dublin's project. I was at Trinity at the time. I did not want it to ever be perceived as being a Trinity College Dublin project. So I ensured that the consortium was put together and everybody was in there on an equal footing and I was pushing it forward. So I think that's important that uh, that there's nobody's, fl it's a national project and everybody becomes partner partnering to that and it's an opportunity for everybody in the consortium. Um, uh, I then, uh, you know, I, I set up uh, Skype calls quarterly, um, I set up an emailing list, I set up the web page, I set up the Twitter feed, um, and then we brought in experts and we tried to have regular seminars. So if there was a national science meeting, we'd always have a LOFAR speaker in there and try to get an international one in. And they'd come in and talk about some great new science and then, you know, other people would be enthused by that. So. There was a multi-pronged approach to it, but it's all about lots of communication and, and inclusivity with people. One thing I would say um, is you haven't said anything about where you're going to get the money from. And I think we should come to that later because I have been down through many rabbit holes to find nothing. And I just wonder what rabbit holes you're looking, you're, you've talked a lot about national funding, but are there opportunities, I, I don't know Latvia where they got their money from, but are there opportunities on the European level through structural funds um, or, you know, does it have to be national in your case? In, in our case, we weren't eligible for, for structural funds, at, uh, at, so, so that was difficult. Um, what else can I say about the consortium? Um, I think that, yeah, uh, we also had our meetings a at the National Academy, which was interesting to have a neutral place for it. And not an, we tried not to have it at the universities. And then it was quite special for people to come to the National Academy. It felt like there was something important going on here. So th 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 I know it sounds like a lot of fluff, but, but it is important that you're serious about this and you have the National Academy who's, you know, supporting this. I also got a lot of letters of support. I started gathering letters of support from people um, and that was also very useful. Uh, the municipality is very important as well in my case. Um, the, mayor, it, the mayor is just the mayor of the area but the politician from the area works on a national level and I found that the member of parliaments knew the prime minister you know, they, they, they're in the same corridors every single day. And so the Prime Minister was only one one person away from us. And so the, the, the Lord Mayors are fine, and you know, you should get to talk to the Mayors. But if you can get to the local politician in the area, then they will say to you, well, why don't you come into the Parliament? And you, I would go into the Parliament and I'd meet them for a cup of coffee. And there was one day where the the Prime Minister was walking past and they said, well, why don't you come and talk to the Prime Minister? And I spoke to the Prime Minister for five minutes about LOFAR. So I would say that politically, get find out where you want the station to be, or maybe find three and put them in competition to each other. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and, but talk to the politician and that gets you into government in a way that going to the science agency or the, he I found the head of the science agency was useless uh, uh, they, 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 he, 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 well, he implemented what the government gave him, 
and uh, didn't like change, I really didn't like what we were saying. They had a strategy. I was, well, who was I to disrupt their strategy? But then when the, when the minister comes in from here and another minister comes in from here and then somebody from the European Parliament comes in from here, then he felt the pressure. So I don't, I, 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 but I only learned that as I went along. I'll, st I'll stop here, but I think there's some important things in there, though, about forming the consortium and then getting national pr pressure. So I don't know. Maybe I can just add a little bit, but the idea is exactly the same for us. Okay. Uh, well, almost. Uh, regarding the funding part, uh, in our case, it was uh, fully national funds, right? But, but the way how we uh, get this money to build the station is uh, exactly what Peter described. Uh, we did go to local m municipality and uh, at the time, well, two or three things happened si simultaneously. One is that uh, the party from which was the mayor was actually uh, the majority of the parliament as well. So, so it was quite easy for them to get things through. So if this part, the, the local people like this, they pitch it to their party, their, uh, the party likes it, they can uh, get it through the government. And uh, th this was one thing. And the other one is that they really wanted to show that our region, which is away from capital, the Riga, is in some way better than the big city. Right, so, so this was a good opportunity to show how our sort of rural area is better than the uh, center. So they took this idea and uh, this was the driving force uh, which got the funds. Uh, regarding the consortium, yeah, uh, it's exactly uh, the way described previously. Just uh, look at the universities who at least on paper, should be interested in this and uh, go visit them, speak with their uh, rectors uh, of research and uh, so on. And of course, uh, constant uh, visits to the Ministry of uh, Science and Education as well. So, so when you start to do this, the consortium so, sort of uh, naturally shows itself and well, once that's done, you can put it on paper, put the strategy for the consortium. Yeah, interestingly enough, perhaps uh, I can echo a lot of uh, what is said to the left and right of me um, over time. So uh, when um, the uh, when Lofar was conceived, it was more or less uh, a, a double ideas that came together. On the uh, uh, science side, um, one of the uh, uh, fathers of, of Lofar is uh, George Miley, Irishman. Um, who uh, is a Leiden professor and wanted to do a, uh, a survey, uh, more or less like the LOTS survey that uh, I uh, talked about this morning. And that was his idea, and he, he thought that you could uh, use a fairly simple dipole array for that. At the same time, there were uh, engineers at Astron uh, thinking ahead about the uh, square kilometer array and the kind of techniques you would need to use. Uh, and uh, one of the engineers, Jaap Brechman, uh, had ideas about what you would need to do at low frequencies to make uh, uh, problems tractable that I also talked about this morning about calibration and uh, in fact needing lots of antennas and then lots of, of smarts behind it. So those two ideas came together. Um, that was the, the, uh, the concept, late 90s I'm talking about now, 1990s. Um, and then some of the same factors came into play. Um, and actually, m maybe to think about also for here, um, Astron ended up raising the stakes. We did not go for the simplest, cheapest solution because we found out we could get just a few more people and then a few more people and then a few more people on board. If we made it into a multi-application system, it started to get a wider appeal. Um, and uh, then uh, we uh, very quickly, uh, still at the end of the 90s, formed a consortium of, of um, all of the Dutch universities where there was uh, a, uh, an astronomy group, uh, plus uh, some of the technical universities as well, uh, who were uh, interested in uh, well uh, both electronics receiver technology, but also AI, things like that. 
um, in uh, in order to to make sure that there was something for everyone in there. Um, and then it was an idea looking for money. In fact, quite a lot of money for the Dutch system, of course. And that came from an unconventional source. And that's maybe something else for you to think about. It was also, I think, what you were hinting at, Peter. Um, in the Dutch case, um, believe it or not, um, our provinces where, where Astron is located is considered the underprivileged region of the Netherlands. Um, it's uh, Yes, it is the region of the, of the highest unemployment and what, what the rest of it. So that means that the Dutch government has to pay attention to uh, local uh, champions in our politics. So having the provincial governor on board was very important because that provincial government was an ex-minister. And so he had in his address book the current prime minister and the minister of science. And so again, we were one step away from the money. And the money was very unconventional. Um, there was a, uh, a planned high-speed rail line to the north, um, which was uh, not a very good idea. And uh, actually, they discovered in time that that was not a very good idea. That liberated a lot of money that still had to be spent on the north. And we were there, and we had the plan ready, and we told them, do this. It's a nice high technology kind of thing for the north. Uh, companies in the north actually uh, have uh, been uh, part of producing the hardware for LOFAR, the data, first data center in Groningen in the north. Everything happened to slot into place. It was unconventional money, and that's the other thing. So we had, on the one hand, the support of all of our universities, technical as well as, as astronomical. On the other hand, we could say, look, we're not threatening your conventional sources of money. We're not taking your annual budget from which you, you uh, take your, your research projects yourself. Um, this is new, it's additional money. And that translates to today, LOFAR 2.0. It's the same thing. We, we are actually having, to, there is a Dutch consortium still, um, uh, and a luck. Uh, nowadays it's more astronomical than it is uh, multidisciplinary. Uh, we need to work a bit on that. Um, but it's very important to make sure that we listen to our uh, astronomical community. What is it they want for the next phase, LOFAR 2.0? But then also to point out that uh, no, we are being reasonable, reasonable about where to get the money and how to get the money, the timescales to get the money. Um, we want to be on roadmaps, but that means that we can take the longer term perspective. We're not going to be asking for money anymore in 2020. Here's, here's the perspective. So be non-threatening in that way as well. It's, it's important. And, and um, try to get the unconventional route. Uh, find your, 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 your provincial governor or your, or your whatever. Um, I don't know if there are regions in, in Bulgaria where it might be easier to uh, justify such an expense. Uh, but Again, it's so uh, remarkably, it's 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 more or less the same kind of story. Be prepared to do the legwork. Oh, and one final thing that that I was also reminded by: uh, w when we started to build, um, we hired somebody from the municipality to uh, go and, and and literally be around um, in the uh, village uh, cafe, in in the in the in the town hall to answer the questions of the population. What are they doing here? Why are they doing it? Uh, somebody who uh, also uh, uh, was, uh, he had been active in, in local politics, so he knew all the Lord Mayors of the, of, of the local municipalities, but he also was the kind of person who would just be able to chat with the, the villagers, the, the farmers, and explain to them how fascinating it was that they were privileged to be part of this. And that worked well. Thank you. Any questions about that? If no, no, I have I have many more questions, so don't worry. Um, okay, so related to this, uh, I'd like to continue about talking about the consortia. Um, well, there are many aspects, but um, so first of all, you you mentioned that the the you have to present this as as uh, uh, in a way that's not threatening to anyone, including astronomers. Um, and in Bulgaria, there's a very, very big optical astronomy community. Uh, I mean, it's mostly optical astronomy community. Um, so that definitely means that we need to be looking for additional funding that's not the funding allocated for uh, for optical astronomy. Um, and but how how were you able to? And this is for everyone. Uh, how were you able to get on board the 
the, the, the astronomers who were optical astronomers who had no experience with radio observations. I mean, uh, I'm sure this happened in the Netherlands, definitely in, in Ireland. This is one question. Uh, yeah, okay, let's just go through that first. Hmm. I don't know if somebody wants to start. Do you want to? Uh, uh, that's a very difficult question. Um, I guess in our case there was no other game in town you know there the, so the national funding agency funded IT biotech nanoscience at a very internationally competitive level the optical astronomers were basically unfunded um, and so they their attitude was that we were probably going to lose and not get the money and so but by putting the consortium together getting them all talking together, getting them supporting it. We got LOFAR done, and then ESO happened as well. So I, you guys are members of, of ESO. You're not, you're not, okay, you're not. So, so I believe that ESO happened as a result of LOFAR. Uh, we opened up new communication channels with uh, the ministry. The astronomers learned how to get themselves organized. The astronomers understood how to make, uh, make um, cases that the ministry understood and liked you know so you have to look at what their pain is what their trouble is and how you're going to fix it how you're going to help them rather than just going in with a begging bowl so your messaging has to help them achieve their strategic goals and uh, that 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 can be around training it can be around skills it can be around rural development it can be around those unconventional routes uh, because science doesn't always resonate with these people uh, and I don't mean these people in, in a bad sense, but they, they have different targets than a scientist would have. And, and I learned not to walk in and say that I cared about near relativistic electrons that are experiencing an instability uh, that, that you know, could tell me about you know, the, a nano Tesla magnetic field around a CME. You know, that's the last thing that they want to hear, hear about. But so I, I learned a, a new language, uh, but I had to read their strategies and understand that in, in order to get that right. Um, so the community came on with that, and, and um, so, so I think LOFAR changed a lot of things uh, for us on a national level. Um, so we weren't, the optical astronomers didn't feel threatened by it, but they saw it as something that they could be part of, and then they learned from it, I, I, would, I would say. Um, and I think others would agree with me in the Irish community about that. So I think it's important to point out that even before the ILOFAR consortium was put together and um, Ireland became serious about radio astronomy, Peter started to develop quite rudimentary radio astronomy skills amongst his students in the group. So, for example, I originally started out doing uh, visible radio astronomy, optical stuff, and it, it was shifted away from that into using quite simple TV antennas with Callisto, which you're familiar with. So, this the radio, low frequency radio science, uh, in general, was developed uh, from the ground up even before ILOFAR came along, and it was important because the low frequency radio science PhD students got to publish papers which were physical proof that it can be a scientific success to have this kind of astronomy in our community. And then that's also a good sell when you go asking for even bigger infrastructure. So with, with more infrastructure in low frequency radio astronomy, you know, you'll get even more papers because with the simple stuff you also get papers too. So the, the funding came in at a, a PhD funding level as well as the ILO for Consortia and the national funding level. Uh, I can add, add a little bit about our Latvian experience and uh, actually we are experiencing a, a little bit of a pushback from our existing astronomers because they are busy with their own research and they don't want to necessarily uh, switch towards a new instrument. Uh, however, uh, doing the twinning project, uh, g coming to these kinds of uh, events, learning what you can do with the instrument and then uh, having the knowledge basis to say actually this supplements your research actually this is the same thing uh, only from a different angle gets uh, the existing astronomers interested in using this tool uh, additionally you saw how many people are involved in uh, building the station right and uh, if you can attract students 
who later become uh, PhD students who do the research. Uh, this could be a very interesting uh, uh, way how to attract them, say, okay, you, you have been here with the instrument from the day zero, use it. You, you use it to establish a new group, no, not necessarily to take uh, the optical observers and say, switch to this, but uh, tr try to attract uh, the newer generation and uh, allow them to build their own teams around this. Yeah, I think here that that situation is, of course, a little bit different because uh, we were one of the pioneering nations in radio astronomy, and and so it was well understood what what radio astronomy would add. But it, but still, um, we try to keep explaining at every university what is it that radio can bring to your research. Um, the other thing that leads more to a question actually is um, we've gotten into the habit of doing decadal planning which starts with science questions and then asks well which tools are, are needed for that and fairly naturally r radio tools have have their place in there but but it's it's a way to also unite the national community around um, well uh, then therefore the funding needs to be spread in such and so a way and, and, and this is how everyone will get uh, their fair share as it were. Is, is any such um, dialogue happening here? So I mean this assumes that you can get the funding agency to listen to you and to read that decadal survey. Um, so uh, I don't know maybe my colleagues can say more to this, but I think that they're not there yet. I don't think they have the the capacity to to process such information uh, and and sort of plan accordingly. So we have this national infrastructure for uh, uh, an infrastructure roadmap, which presumably provides funding. Uh, though in in the case of of the other uh, uh, project that uh, our institute was involved is involved in. Uh, uh, ratio, it it was late by what is it like five or ten years late or something. But the funding is coming now. Uh, but in general, I, I I'm not sure we are ready for uh, such for, for such planning. Um, uh, in terms of 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 funding, that and the, the roadmap is what provides the funding. Is basically the government signing off on new infrastructure that will get done at some point. Um, in terms of the, the regional funding, I can say that there are definitely regions um, in Bulgaria. <clears throat> For example, the Northwest region is one of the poorest in the EU. So that's definitely an opportunity for us to, uh, to go and talk to uh, members of parliament from, from the, the, this region, to local, uh, uh, local government, uh, and see what we can do. There are also these uh, um, cross-border funds uh, in areas close to borders between EU member states that we could also uh, think about. So those are definitely um, some points. Yep. Maybe I can say something about the cross-border because ILOFAR is between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland and uh, that was an important part of the project. Um, um, there is a parliamentary body that looks at Northern Ireland and the Republic and, and at one of their parliamentary meetings, uh, Lofar was brought up by by a man who used to carry a gun, you know, so he was a former, you know, uh, you know, IRA person, uh, but he was talking about Lofar, um, and, uh, uh, you know, those days are long gone, uh, but it was, it was strange to hear somebody talking like that, and they were talking about it as a natural cross-border project that, ha you know, uh, wasn't conceived just to get a project going, it, there was real synergies between the North and the South in astronomy. And it actually turned out that the first international agreement signed between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland was in astronomy, for cooperation in astronomy in the 1970s when they did not talk to each other. So it was kind of a continuation of, of, of all of that. But, uh, you know, I, I think for international cooperation, I wouldn't underestimate the importance of that because our Minister for Foreign Affairs saw this person and then rang our science minister and said, this is not just a science project, it's an international cooperation 
it's a cross-border project. And uh, that, again, was another, just another string to our bow. And when I wasn't achieving, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, or their, their, their people, were contacting me and saying, why aren't you getting this done? I said, well, it's not my fault, it's the funding agency's fault. So, so it's good to get these other people who, so if there was, you know, Romania or is it Greece that your other, or other border is with, that uh, maybe there might be a synergy there to do something cross-border. Um, and if there are regions which are, uh, what is, what's the word, uh, underfunded regions, or uh, uh, then maybe that's something to look at. I, I, be concerned about security is one of the things that you should be conscious of. Uh, you put it in a field in the middle of nowhere and it's, it's got a lot of cables in there and it's got a lot of expensive computers. Uh, just be con con conscious of that. People can steal them and vandalise them. So you do have to be careful about that. We have castle walls in ours, but uh, the Dutch have never had any problems and they leave them out. But I think the Dutch are very well behaved people. <laughs> All right, any questions? Uh, so far? Please, this is your opportunity to ask any questions you can think of. Um, if not, I have uh, one more question uh, regarding the, the consortia and, uh, and collaborations and it, it's about business and technology. So we talked about these possibilities um, to involve industrial partners to, uh, to to prepare, uh, let's say, future staff, because we all know not everyone who gets a PhD will be in astronomy, will be work working in astronomy. Um, so can you share any stories of, of such collaboration or, or, or have you been able to get um, um, technological company uh, companies to, to join consortia or contribute in any way? Yeah, so um, for Astron, this happens at, at two levels, um, and I hesitate to say which is the more important for LOFAR. So there is, are indeed the very uh, large com companies, the IBMs of this world, we've had uh, um, a, a very large-scale collaboration with them to uh, uh, research uh, uh, faster computing, both at the hardware and the software level. Uh, with them, and that uh, has received enthusiastic support from the from the Dutch government. Um, on the other hand, we um, structurally have connections again in the northern region um, with platforms of small and medium enterprises. Um, this predates LOFAR for us and uh, and simply continues, and that buys us an enormous amount of credit um, with the politicians both both regionally then, but also then again nationally, who, who see that when they invest in our region, a lot of the money will land locally. This is what happened with LOFAR. And I think in the end, actually, that in order to get LOFAR funded and to keep LOFAR funded, it's the, 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 uh, the demonstrated ability to work with small and medium enterprises from the region that is more important than saying, hey, we are on board with the IBMs of this world, which actually buys you maybe other advantages because uh, some of our uh, uh, engineering researchers um, get to spend a year um, at their lab in Zurich and whatever and learn the latest techniques that way. And, and so that, you know, there is an exchange at a quite different level there and, and it's very beneficial for us to do that. But in terms of getting political support and funding, I think it's the, the SMEs that are more important. Um, so, ILOFAR was funded um, from a call that, where I pitched it as a test bed for data analytics. I said almost nothing about astronomy when I wrote the proposal. And so this was going to be a national infrastructure that companies, SMEs, could test their data analytics skills on a big data source. So they, all those words were the words that I used in the proposal. There was very little astronomy in there. If I was a scientist crit uh, critiquing the proposal, I'd throw it out in a second. Uh, uh, as a technologist or a company person, then it, it had it. So that, that's why we were funded. But that enabled the government to fund it because they had a program for data analytics and data science. And so they were able to then get me off their back by funding the proposal through that mechanism. Um, when we went in with that, we had a number, of, so 
Ireland has a lot of big multinational companies like the IBMs and the Intels and the Xilinx and stuff. So we got to know them all very well and we did get letters of support from them when we wrote our proposals. So they were good on, on that aspect of things. Now that we're funded, um, we're not doing any projects with them. We're still talking to Xilinx, um, th 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 actually, but, but we're not doing anything with them that's funded. But we are working with this KX Systems company. It's a it's a medium-sized company, um, and they they work on data science. Why do they care? A little bit of PR, but they also want the skilled graduates. They really have problems getting skilled graduates in data science. So that's one thing that they're interested in. And then there's another small company of about 10 or 15 people. They work with ESA. They do a little bit, bit of work with uh, NASA. And they're interested in machine learning. And uh, they're interested in some of the image processing work we're doing, some of the machine learning work that we're doing. We're not funded on that, but we are. We've been talking to them on and off for many years, and we do need to get that funded. And they have hired some of my PhD students in the past, and some of their staff have come in to work in my group. So there actually has been flow of people in both directions. So uh, you know, I, I echo that that there has been more activity around the SME. Uh, side of things, um, uh, but don't forget that test bed for data analytics idea. You know, because you're bet you your government has a strategy for big data, data science. Yeah, and so help them achieve their goals in that. <laughs> yeah, well, unfortunately, our experience is not that great as was described by my colleagues here. Uh, Currently, actually, we don't have any uh, industry link. However, there is a big political pressure to establish this, right? Uh, maybe this is uh, a part of Latvia as being a very small uh, country with a small industry. And uh, maybe we even have m more of an opportunity to establish the industry by doing spin-offs in the data sciences and so on, uh, rather than uh, attracting some bigger existing companies to do this. So I if the universities that you are working with uh, have students interested in uh, technical fields and uh, business, then maybe this is an uh, opportunity to uh, link the s science part and the industry part that way. So one more thing, we, we did get sponsorship from a telecommunications company, which was, so the na they used to be the National Telecommunications Company, and uh, uh, so our fibre bill was going to be 50,000 euros per year, and they basically cut it down by two-thirds, but they're on the side of our container, but their CEO was very inf influential, and um, Although there isn't a research link, they're supporting research with the fiber, and they get their name at the bottom of everything that we do, and they're entitled to hold things there. They wanted to put their name on the, the array like Latvia did. Uh, they wanted to call it, the, the name of the company is Air. They wanted to call it Air Scope, and uh, <laughs> we said, no hope. <laughs> so, but but you know that that is something to consider. You know, maybe you want to if you want to zero your electricity bill, go and talk to the electricity company and see if they'll be a sponsor. If you want to zero your fibre bill, but maybe get them to be part of that. And they get enthusiastic enthusiastic about it. And now they're writing you le letters of support, and now they're talking to to uh, people who are decision makers. So th that's another you know uh, thing to try as well, uh, which, is, which is not a direct um, uh, you know, interaction that produces research or anything, but it, it supports the project and shows that they're interested in supporting technology. Yeah. Um, any question? Okay. Um, okay. Well, a last question that I have, it's more about specifics uh, of, of how these consortia are formed in terms of law, in terms of organizations. Um, I know that in, there have been consortia here which are not separate um, legal entities, uh, and that's always very difficult. Uh, it's presumably always better to have a legal entity that 
<clears throat> other legal entities are members of uh, or participants in, but uh, maybe you can share some details or information about how you think and maybe Renee and Carla, since you have experience with all these different uh, nations. Thank you. Yeah, so, um, well, um, I haven't been in law f around law for a long time, so I haven't been able to see many of these consortia to form. But I, what I've noticed is they are very different. So some are very small, some they are very big. In general, what it takes is just having in you know, a couple of institutes willing to commit to this project and basically an MOU, uh, it's uh, a commitment enough uh, to prove to the ILT, which is the ILT, the one that is providing the, at this, at this stage, is providing the legal, the legal structure, right? So national consortia are, are basically bounded by MOUs. Yeah, so again, that's, that's different from one country to the next. Um, there, at some point, a so-called station contract is signed that says um, that there is an existing station that will be committed uh, for five years' worth of operation and there will be an operational contribution from year to year made to the LT. That's made by a legal entity, but that legal entity varies from country to country. Um, and in in um, the case that resembles the Dutch one closest, uh, Sweden, it's the National Radio Astronomy uh, Institute, again, um, on Solar Space Observatory, that makes that commitment on behalf of the Swedish consortium. Um, in the UK case, it's, it's STFC, the funding agency, that is part of their national consortium, the LOFAR UK. It's just one member of it, but it is the one that takes on that responsibility um, and, and has signed the station contract. In the Irish case, it's Trinity College Dublin that has signed the station contract on behalf of the consortium and, and so it, it receives money uh, from the, the national sources and then transmits it. So it, there are really different ways that this is organized. Um, now being optimistic myself, I would say that by the time that there is ever a station contract to be signed uh, from Bulgaria, um, um, the International Law for Telescope might have transformed itself into an ERIC. In that case, um, it's quite clear um, the uh, commitment to be a member will have to be made by the Ministry of, of, of Science and Education or whatever the, the precise name is in the country. Um, and the uh, station will be committed through a service level agreement with whoever owns the station. And, and, and that is something that, uh, again, varies. We have some German stations which are co-owned by various universities, and then one of them takes up the penmanship, as it were, and, and, and signs the contract. Um, but uh, again, situations can, uh, can vary there. So for that, just think about what would suit you, and then we can talk about Will that be uh, possible? Um, the way we started off was with a very loose consortium. Um, and the reason we started off with quite loose is we didn't want people to be committed to anything like a consortium agreement or an MOU to start with. So that meant that we could cast our net very wide and bring in people who were 50-50 or still needed to be convinced. But on the website, you had a number of universities who are now no longer in there because, so for the first five years, they were always there. We had everybody involved. We were talking to the ministry saying everybody's involved. Nobody's put any cash in. Nobody's signed anything. And that was fine. But as we came to the point of signing the consortium agreement, then we needed to formalize. And in order to be part of the club, then there was, you know, a two-page cons consortium agreement. A very, uh, But then people had to bring in money. And once they brought in money, then they became a paid up member of the consortium. And that could be, you know, there was people like Arma who put in a large amount of money. There was people like Trinity who put in a large amount of money. But then there was one entity who put in 5k a year over five years because they couldn't put in the, the 25 or the 50. And, and also, they just didn't have the activity to, to, to justify that that, that financial contribution. So I, I'd start loose to show broad, and then I'd, then as things um, firm up, ask people to, 
if, if they have to con- financially contribute or, a, or or sign. Maybe the, your your guys will not need to to sign anything, but or to to pay in. But uh, yeah, so you need to show wide support. I think is your first uh, thing. So I keep things loose to start with, so that you can put them all on the website. Yeah, if I can just add to that, um, in fact, you might not know, but um, the Dutch consortium that does uh, uh, involve all of the universities is not bound by even an MOU or, or anybody, anybody paying anything in. It's um, Astron takes the responsibility for paying, and, and, and so that's part of its budget. But the universities and the university researchers are part of that club. It's no more than a club, actually. We, and we keep it loose that way. Yeah, we, we want to include all of the Dutch universities. It, it's it's a, a good way to uh, to have the community uh, hang together, um, but there is no money involved uh, from the universities directly. Yeah. We, we actually didn't uh, exclude uh, non-Irish. So we had, there was a, there's a, an Irish guy who's a professor in Caltech, so he became an associate member, so we wanted to show the Caltech connection. Uh, then we had somebody, I think Anna Scaife from from Manchester, was, she was at Southampton at the time, and then we had someone else. There was three di- different universities who were non-Irish, and it was to show that they wanted to use the facility if it was built. Um, so I, I wouldn't preclude that. Um, so try to... Maybe there are Bulgarian researchers abroad, or or so it, it, diaspora is what we call it. I, I don't know if that's a word that's yep. commonly used, but the diaspora can be supportive internationally, and by putting their name to it at prestigious institutions, that can be important as well. So we're clearly getting to the brainstorming stage here, but uh, uh, linking back to to uh, what you said earlier, Peter, about the international collect- connection, you can also consider it that way. If there are researchers in other countries, Greece, Romania, whatever, neighboring countries uh, in in southeastern Europe, you might want to consider whether you can make them members of your consortium to uh, shore up the science and technology interest and and, and whatever. And at this stage, uh, that seems to be uh, uh, very, very beneficial and would not harm them in any way. But it's, it's, it's not related to this, because we discuss about the political uh, commitment that you require, talking to politicians, talking to SMEs, talking to your national consortium. I think another aspect that is really important is to also uh, use this as an outreach and education uh, opportunity, because besides to the political commitment, you need also the society, the students, you know, small children to see why why do we need this? So I think this is something you need. And I saw it, it was in one of your slides, you have it as one of your stakeholders. But for example, at Astron recently, we, you know, we are, we are located in this very remote region that René says is one of the most disadvantaged of the Netherlands. And actually now we are a hub for really high tech. And actually in this little village of Duingelo, a few months ago, we opened a science hub. So it's a, it's a place where children are introduced to astronomy, to radio astronomy, and uh, it's an example in the Netherlands. And I think you, you should also take also this angle of this, this problem because it will uh, strengthen your, your case. Yes, uh, I think, I mean, as I mentioned, there, there are a few uh, sort of advanced uh, uh, children's museums that do very interesting things and I think definitely we can collaborate with them uh, installing some demos related to LOFAR or something so we can definitely talk about that um, are there any questions anything specific or general no Maybe yep. like the, I, I, I really wouldn't underestimate the power of the um, you know the public engagement side of things. Um, there's a gentleman called Pedro Russo that you really should meet. Um, and Pedro's in Leiden, and uh, he's a professor of astronomy and society. I think is his is his title, but he's he, he gets involved in leading major EU Horizon 2020 pr- projects around astronomy and engagement, and and so you know I'm working with him. 
I think you can learn a lot from from him. But one thing that he did was he set up something in Portugal and they were looking for a tourist destination in this regional area. And now they have this astronomy and science centre that people are coming into. But you could imagine somebody's looking for, for a way of attracting people into a region. There's a low-fire station, there's a visitor centre beside it. You know, they may fund your low-fire station because they need they need, need it to attract people into the visitor centre. So it's, a, it's again about that unconventional route to the funding. Um, but, you know, I, I think we as scientists also, you know, in our careers we make impacts in terms of science and discoveries and the Nobel Prize. Uh, I mean, but th and that has to be what we, we as scientists do. But we teach undergraduates, we train postgraduates, and we disseminate our results to the wider public and we make a more scientifically informed public who make decisions on climate change and nuclear power and and, and and I think we have a role in all of those things and when we're writing our proposals it, it is the science, it is the training and it is the public engagement that's really important about what we do and low far, a low far station here can help you do those things and, and I think bring them together and, and don't just think about the research.